Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasts. If you can make bad choices, you sure as hell can make some good choices. Hello and welcome to True Crime Connections. This is where I talk with real people about real shit. I'm Tiffany, your host, and today I am here with Jeff O'Neill, who is a clinical counselor and here to teach us about how to break free from family trauma. So welcome, Jeff. Well, thank you. I'm very excited uh, to chat today and uh, see how we can sort of uh, help some people that uh, may be stuck, uh, feeling feeling stuck in their situation and uh, and wondering what are some maybe some small steps they can take just to just to feel not feel the same way. Every little bit of knowledge can help because a lot of people don't even realize that what they're in is like generational abuse or the cycle. It repeats itself a lot. And we're just kind of starting to realize that more and more, I think, as more research goes on and into it. Yeah, I think that that's a huge thing. So like, you know, with with generational trauma, right, or intergenerational trauma, those those are the two kind of main names for it, right? It's it's passed down, right? So, you know, it starts with with one generation and moves down. So when you live it, when you're in an environment that that's the known way of being, right, with abuse, with, you know, with addiction, right? Like, if there's nothing there to sort of tell you that it, that's wrong, right? If there's no one that's saying, wait a minute, there's actually a different way of living life. It's very difficult to know actually what is happening to you or what you're experiencing as a child or adolescent is is wrong or is not healthy, right? Because that's just been your way, your frame of reference for life for since you were born. Um, and it's also been your family's frame of reference for generations, right? And there's been no real break there, right? And, you know, some families do move to different countries to try and break some of that, right? But then they might sometimes get caught in that because of the, of the stress of moving to a new country, being, um, you know, an immigrant, and that comes with its own stressors and traumas. So there are sometimes extreme things that that people try to do to, to break that right when they actually recognize it but then of course like it just sort of continues like you said because then they might get caught in a new cycle of trauma right and that sort of stays with the family and eventually someone uh, or some outsider might say like hmm have you thought about it this way or oh like that was your experience like this was my experience of childhood i'm curious like why you think maybe this is okay so it's it is really uh it's a very difficult thing to to snap, right? Because it is so ingrained. It is so, especially if you live in a in, in a community uh, that has that generational trauma. So, like, here, I'm from Canada, um, and we, you know, have been studying and learning a lot about our indigenous peoples, right? And there is a mass amount, mass amount of generational trauma uh, from how the Canadian government. Uh, treated these people to where it is still affecting these communities to this day in 2024 and it started you know all the way back in the, like the 1800s right so that's how ingrained this can be because if you're just the next generation is is still sort of wrapped in that trauma it's very difficult to get out of it without you know some intervention or you know the other thing is too is trust um that the new way of thinking is going to be helpful right like you know for indigenous people here in canada it's they don't really trust the government right or, tr- or trust outsiders because in their history uh that's turned into some very problematic things for them right so yeah, it's a it's a tr- it's a tricky thing, but you know, once someone can actually recognize that maybe this isn't what it should be, that's a really good positive step in sort of helping you know take the different route to maybe breaking that that chain or cycle of trauma in the family or or cultures. It took me until like my thirties until I was like, mm. son of a bitch, was <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> maybe this person wasn't as evil as i thought it was it's because of what they went through 
and they didn't know the difference and And it went down generation after generation so it's exactly like you don't know better you don't right and like it's also around where you're living too right so like you know here in canada we have indigenous people and of course the u.s has a whole swack of different communities that like not only is there are they passing down the trauma but like it's also in the poverty cycle right and like government and environmental happenings that are keeping that cycle where it is right like if you're stuck in the same environment with the same people it's very difficult to to snap that right and you know and unfortunately some people to break it right will will feel like they have to leave their culture or leave their families right and sometimes that is the best thing like the family's just unhealthy it's just it's not good for you um you do need to separate yourself from that but you know, back to indigenous people in Canada, then then they're abandoning their culture, right? Which is, you know, when someone wants to work on themselves, you want to work on the mind, body, and spirit. And spirit obviously can be many different things to many different people. But if you look at, you know, indigenous people, leaving a part of their culture behind that is very important to lots of people, right? But not just indigenous people, right? Like if you have to leave your family or leave another culture that it can kind of leave a stain on it, right? Which is which can be problematic because then you might have this cultural indifference uh, in your life because you might associate your culture with the trauma, right? Which we want to separate it out because you know, it's not indigenous people's faults, right? It's not you know any minority culture's fault that they were treated a certain way in a certain country, right? That's just how the government or the the the, the time when like how they were viewed by a person, right? Like it's it's really circumstantial, right? Like I think about as well, like, you know, the conflict that's going on with Israel and and uh, Palestine. That's going to put a stain on, you know, Palestinians and on, you know, Judaism. And that's not Judaism's or Palestinian people's fault. That's just how people are viewing it right now. So that's just, that's creating a like a situational trauma um, for people of those, um, each of those, uh, cultures, right? And then, you know, if they, if it turns into a longer stem thing, people might have a stain on their culture, which it's, it needs to be separated. Like it's not the culture itself that is the problem. It's just however the environment at that time is really seeing it, right? And so, like, that's some work too for someone that's, that has gone through that. If they have some kind of distinct culture they like attest to, right? Even religion too. Religion's gone through quite a bit of quite a bit of you know, reflection and looking at what how they know the history of it right and you know some people who are who are religious face some you know pushback because of some of the history of it right but it doesn't mean like if you are religious you like you are a bad person right like it's just it's 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 kind of blanketing it and stereotyping it right to a certain thing so we don't we don't want you know your culture whatever that's religion uh you know indigenous culture right any kind of distinct culture being sort of tainted by the trauma that happened to it right because then it just it creates that internal conflict in someone you know if someone breaks free of of their generational trauma and you know doesn't interact with their families and things like that and again it that might be for the the best circling back and and taking a more um, subjective view at things like your culture to see you know okay what is this actually like what positives does it actually bring right and how has it been treated in in where i am because it like that's a really important piece right like you know cultural connection i think can be very tainted by generational trauma oh for sure i mean i know at least here in america first of all we don't trust the government either (laughs) so (laughs) But somebody says like they're Catholic or something. The first thing people jump to is, oh, so you like little boys. You know what I mean? It's like, no, not every Catholic is an abuser. So it's we got to break these stigmas because it's not fair. It it isn't right. And it creates, again, it creates more more like internal conflict. Right. Um, and sometimes people turn to religion for answers. Right. Like and because, you know, it, it does offer a structure and it does offer, you know, a meaning to life right and sometimes when someone is feeling lost like that could be their answer right um and that you know that includes you know kind of heading back to your culture right but i think you're very right in that people are really starting to accept mental health and accept some of these ideas that maybe it's time to not follow in the same footsteps as our family right and i agree i agree like with the knowledge of like you know 
you know, maybe my dad or mom was, you know, emotionally abusive, physically abusive, sexually abusive, right? Where did that come from? Because like babies don't wake up and and become abu- like are automatically abusers, right? Like it it really depends like what was their upbringing, right? And if you look at North America specifically, like we are a very uh, trauma inducing continent. Like if we look at history, right? So not not to mention our indigenous people and of course a lot of the minority populations in the U.S. that have faced multiple layers of racism and genocide for some of them right and lots of unfairness and you know of course poverty right like that's just that's a lot to get over for one generation right but you know in general like you know we live in a capitalist society right which is very traumatizing right because if you know if you go back a few generations it's you know dads are in the coal mine you know moms are at home and there's lots of trauma associated with that then you move to you know into the factory sector, right? That's also very traumatizing. Um, you know, and mental health obviously wasn't very discussed. There was a lot of secrecy in, in the past where like if there is abuses, it was either accepted, it was just, you know, that was the type of punishment back then, or it was just families don't say anything. We keep we keep secrets. And secrets actually is a really uh how do I say I want to say this like it it's a um, it trigger? It, and it's not trigger, but like it, it's sort of like a, a conductor, for lack of a better term. Like it keeps trauma going because there's these secrets that families don't talk about. So, you know, an uncle abused uh, a, a cousin or, uh, you know, a, if there's abuse there and families don't bring it up and talk about it, um, or if it kind of gets brought up, they push it to the side, like that continues the the trauma, right? Because it's not recognized and trauma needs to, to get out. It can't stay because then it just metastasizes, it turns into addiction, it turns into these numbing type uh, behaviors because either you want, you need to face it, recognize it, or you're going to numb it, right? And that can look at, look very different for many, many different people. But you know, I think it's really important just to recognize that, like, you know, the, obviously we, you know, when we look at generational trauma, we, we can certainly look at, you know, minority populations and indigenous people here in Canada, right? Like, and that's completely true, but it's also we need to look at everybody because I think a lot of our family histories can have some kind of layer of trauma in it, right? Whether you have, like, you know, you know Canada and the U.S. have a big number of immigrants. So, it's important to see, like, what does that look like? What does immigrating from a new country look like? What traumas do, do that bring? The cultural clashes of, you know, going from one country to to another country. So yeah, there, there's there's so many different different layers to it, right? And I think it's really affected a lot of people, like not just the specific ones we look at, right? Like I think it's actually quite widespread for most people. It would be my because, uh, like you said. Most crime, if you look at it, you're going to look at, you're going to find a history of a trauma. Most addiction issues, if not all addiction issues, I shouldn't say all, there's always outliers. Um, there's, there's a link back to trauma. Really kind of any sort of behavioral challenge we see that there's most of the time some sort of conductor or starter uh, that started in a family, which that family has a history of it. So it's, it's really in, ingrained and intertwined in a lot of things that probably we're seeing in the mental health and, uh, and, and criminology field. I love just how much people are now being open about mental health. I mean, shoot, 20 20- 30 years ago, you did not talk about mental health. You did not say, oh, you know, I'm feeling this way or that way. You kept it to yourself because if anybody went and saw what we used to call them shrinks back then, you know, (laughs) (laughs) you go to a shrink, you're crazy. You're a crazy person. You're going to lay on that couch and, you know, just... And we don't do that anymore. We embrace it. It's time to break the stigma because I think it's fair to admit we're all a little bit broken, you know? Yeah. Nobody's perfect. We've all gone through some kind of struggle. So shit, by the time I want to say you're in high school, you've already been through some shit. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right. And I I think you're, you're dead on when it comes to like recognition of mental health. Right. And I think, you know, we had this massive global pandemic that really put a, a magnifier on it right because we are like we, everything that we use pretty much to be healthy right you know exercise social connections right you know work work like these are can be something you know uh community events right these are all things that are very healthy for people i guess not sometimes not work but, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um going to work can can be a very healthy thing for people that all got taken away 
and now coming out of the pandemic, you know, if you look at research, like people's mental health is probably the worst it's been in quite a long time. Now that could also be like we're saying people are talking about it than they've ever had before. So it could be a bit of like co- uh, coincidence or just, uh, you know, people are more, more focused on it than they've ever been before. And then we had this pandemic, so people are willing to talk about it. Um, but for me, I, if we look at generational trauma, I do see the pandemic creating another generation of trauma because, you know, people did delay having kids in, in some essence. And then when they did, there was a ton of fear, like a ton, ton of fear around, you know, what would that look like? You know, hospitals restricted people being in the hospital for the birth, right? Like you couldn't, you know, typically some people have like their whole family in the birth room, right? And that's as part of their culture or part of their fam- familial belief uh, to have their family in there. Um, but that was taken away. And then you have this baby and you're super worried about about what's going to happen with this baby, right? And you can't socialize properly. You know, raising a child is very difficult. Um, you do need help. That's why the famous saying, it's, uh, it takes a village to raise a child. It's incredibly accurate. Um, it, uh, you do need familial support or some kind of support. There are amazing single parents out there. And shout out to all those single parents. Good Lord, you are superheroes that can do it. But like, really, you just think you need some kind of support. And that was really taken away. And for me, like it's also a ge- on the genetic level. Um, there's epigenetics uh, as well. I've, have you discussed that on the podcast before? I have not. Okay, so epigenetics is um, I'm not a, I'm not a scientist, but I have you know read a lot of studies on it, um, and it's around experiences actually being passed down genetically uh, as as well. Um, so like when we have experience, there's nature versus nurture, right? That's a, that's always that's a very popular saying right so you know we know we have sometimes a predisposition to something right cancer heart disease and all that stuff doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get it right depends how you take care of yourself depends on your environment well that also depend that also counts for other things like like mental health conditions um and sometimes even addiction and even though again if you even if you have a predisposition to be a certain way doesn't mean you will be however if you look at some of the studies um it has been shown that um in our genes they can be passed down to the next generation right and that also includes like mental health condition and epigenetics is a cool thing because the the concept is that um you can like genes can be turned on and off like so how a, a doctor has a uh, doctor who was famous in doing this explained it is that our genes are like a library uh and the idea of epigenetics is you can just you just go pick the books that get activated it's it, it's fascinating because you can be passed down but then those genes can be turned off by the next generation right it doesn't always have, doesn't always mean it's going to be constantly passed down that's where, like, I see that this this new generation with COVID babies, right, and people having babies during COVID, is that there there's might be some more stress you know, hormones and things like that that were activated and passed down to the next generation that may not have been there if the pandemic hadn't existed, right? And that's why we with, with tr- generational trauma, there is a, a like a, a genetic aspect to it as well. Um, I mean, I believe it was the 9/11. They 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 surveyed some. Uh, some moms around in 9/11, and they noticed that their, you know, their children were more susceptible to stress and things like that than than a control group, right? Just because they went through that stress, right? So it's it's really fascinating, and why generational trauma can be so challenging to break, right? Because it's you know not only environmental, it's also you know biological, right? It's that again, nature and nurture when they're together can can really bring things together. Um, that's where. Like it's important for me. I'm a big person about environment, right? Like even though you, even though you might have a predisposition for cancer, like it's in your family, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get it. Uh, it just depends on how you take care of yourself, right? And that that depend. That's the same thing with mental health. Uh, in my view, is that even though you might genetically be more predisposed to some some of these things, like anxiety, depression, or or you know anger, doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be your future. Like it really depends on how you take care of yourself. Um, and how nurtured, right? That's why it's called nurture, right? Like if you nurture it, if you stay in, a, in, a, in an abusive environment and in a very trauma and stressful inducing environment, that that'll keep those genes activated. But if you know, if you sort of break the cycle and and change it, it gives you it gives you a, a better chance of turning those genes off and turning different genes on that you can, that, that can be passed down to the next generation. For sure. I mean, I think first of all, identifying when you see that you are going 
in these same circles. Because I did at one point start to pinpoint things that were done to me. And that's when I said, nope, that's nope, we're not doing this. And I had a hard conversation with myself, put myself in timeout and <laughs> work through it because yeah. you have to, you can't keep doing it because it does nothing for nobody. It's going to hurt the person you're doing it to. And deep down it hurts you because yep. you know, you're not supposed to be doing it. You know, right from wrong. Absolutely. Are you looking for your next true crime podcast? Do you crave stories that have mystery and suspense? Well, look no further. Introducing Love and Murder, the podcast that dives deep into the world of relationships gone horribly wrong. Every week, I take you on a journey through the dark side of love, where passion turns into obsession, family becomes enemies, and romance turns to murder. So why should you listen to Love and Murder? Because this is not just another true crime podcast. We're your partners in crime, your storytellers, and your weekly dose of suspenseful entertainment. So what are you waiting for? Join the Lamb community, www.murderandlove.com. That's love and murder backwards, murderandlove.com. See you soon. Now that we've sort of discussed the the you know the genetic and the and the historical things, right? I think it's definitely important now to see like, okay, so now we know we're in this, right? We may have passed on genetically to us. Um, we're, you know, we're maybe still in an environment. Or uh, if you're sometimes if you're a parent, you sometimes see your parenting style match that of what your parents had, right? Even though you might vehemently say, "I will never be like my my parents," because what of what happened to you? And you know, maybe you you had some abuse that your parents gave you and you're you're never going to do that i think that's quite accurate um but you know some of the like other behavioral stuff right like that's uh it's just it's just natural it's how we learn right we learn from our past generation right and especially parenting is a very generation teaching uh, perspective yes of course we can you know look at books and there's lots of education out there but we definitely parent from our experiences at first. And then, like you said, it's it's that bit of that mental time out to say, like, is this really what I want to be doing? So I think a big thing about breaking generational trauma and sort of your trauma in general is to, I think the first key phrase is that, you know, you're not your trauma, right? Everything that happened to you in your childhood, in your past was 100% not your fault. And like, I know I'm going to sound like good with the therapist from Goodwill Hunting, but it really is true, right? Like, it's easy to like see, like, and face some blame of like, I should have protected myself. I should have done X, Y, Z. But if you really look at it, any kind of childhood abuse or trauma, you had zero control over it. You were a child, and a child's dependent on adults keeping them safe, right? Like, that is just the key. That is like the basis of. Of child, of, right? Your your job is to go out in the world and explore it, and ideally, you have some parents um, or caregivers, depending on if you're in foster care or not, that are there to protect you and keep you safe from the major traumas, right? Like, of course, you're going to go out and still get hurt. That's just the world is a cruel place, but you know, in the end, whatever trauma it was—sexual, physical, neglect, exploitation, addiction—that wasn't your fault. Like it really wasn't. I think that's the first key to accept getting out of this cycle is that what happened to me or what is happening to me, depending on the age of persons listening to this or reflecting is not my fault. You didn't ask to be abused. You didn't ask to be um, traumatized. I mean, most people don't want to be our body. Our bodies actually actively get away from it. Right. But releasing yourself from that blame is the first step. Right, because we don't want to be responsible for other people's behavior, and even with domestic violence too, right? Like that, it becomes a tricky, um, a tricky slope because you know people will, will blame themselves for not getting out of the out of the relationship sooner. But you got to like it's it's tricky because the person you know who's abusing you, like a narcissist or someone who's very good at gaslighting, they're like they're they're kind of programming you. They're like a Pavlov's dog kind of thing. Like it's their job to keep you there. I like when I work with people who are in gender based gender based violence um, relationships that have gotten out, or you know, working with them uh, to sort of give them some education on it. It's around like you can make that choice, and then when you make that choice, 
to leave, that is the first step, right? That's you putting yourself first. And, you know, when they, but if they already, every other trauma, right, that you face in your life, it, it, I, I know I keep, I sound like a broken record, but it's, it, it's the, I'm trying to help sink it in that it, you really got to accept it's not your fault. Like you did not ask for any of this and that the trauma you have experienced is not you. It's, it's, it's your trauma, right? And it's, it's, it's there. It's, it's made you act a certain way for because of a, it's trying to you know your body's trying to protect you from further trauma right so it's an interesting it's interesting work to to get over trauma because your body is reacting to act to protect you and that might look at like like addiction right that might look like you know video game addiction sex addiction gambling uh, you know substance use right like that actually is a form of protection because it's it's not it's not having you face what you went through because your body doesn't want you to go through it. So it's one of those things of just simply saying like, okay, it wasn't my fault. That and it, and what I'm experiencing or what I experienced is not me, and I can sort of move forward and be uh, what I want to. Be. Oh right, I oh, mean, right. getting over this. Getting over this. It's a lifelong journey. You're not going to wake up one day and be like, holy Absolutely. shit, I'm healed. You know, it's, it doesn't work that way. you got to work through it every single day. And you've mm-hmm. got to work to be a better version of yourself. And to be able to notice when you're going down those paths that you do not belong to turn around and bring yourself back on the right path. Yeah. So the, so the second phase that is, is going easy on yourself. So when we learn any new skill, it takes time to, you know, master it, right? Not be perfect, but master it, right? So changing your your mindset and how you act is basically learning a new skill, right? And like why I mentioned the, the, the physical body piece, right? So, you know, if, you know, if you are an addiction, for example, it's just an easy example, and you're working, actively working to slow it down or stop it, like you said, overnight, you're not going to stop right? Like it's your body has done a certain thing to keep you going. You're in survival mode. That's a huge thing too. People in trauma is they, they are in survival mode, right? They're bought, you're just, they're just waking up to get through the day and to go to bed. So like all of this is going to be a fundamental shift for you. Uh, someone who's getting over trauma, right? My philosophy is like, as long as you're taking one step forward, whether it's small or big, then you're 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 carving that path to a, a to your to the future you want, right? Not the future that you feel like you have because of your past. And that's another big thing too is like you are not your trauma, and your past does not mean it's going to be your future. You do have the power to really look at that and say, what do I want to be, right? And how do I get there? And when you're trying to get there, it's it's being easy on yourself when you make those expected stumbles because you know if you're like may, like maybe you've you moved away from your family, but because you have that complex trauma relationship with your family, maybe you're contacting them more than you want, and you feel this weird drive to contact them because you miss them, right? And you're like, why do I miss them? They're so they're so they've been so bad to me, right? Like because it's that. It's that safety in where your trauma thinks it's a safety thing, right? Like you're all off by yourself. So it's one of those things where like your body's going to go back to what it, it's been doing to keep you going, right? And that's okay. It's just when you start to feel that, you know, acknowledge it and go, okay, you know, maybe I'll, instead of sending, you know, a, doing a phone call and a text to someone who is uh, abusive to me, I'll just do a text right? Like that's a step forward. You're doing one less thing than you would have, right? And then maybe the next day or the next week, you you, you give yourself, you know, six hours where you don't contact anybody, right? It's that slow burn to help you get to the place you want to be and to break that, that cycle. Right. I feel like so many times we put limitations on ourselves. Like before Mm -hmm. we even try, I can remember I was I gave up things so easily because it was obviously the easier way to do it instead of to stick yeah. through it, fight it out. You know, I would just give up. And now I refuse. Look at me. I refuse to give up this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And and well, and that's the thing is because trying something new is uncomfortable, right? Like is because we're not good at it. So naturally our body's gonna 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 stop because you have had a lifetime of uncomfortableness. So why would you 
why would you can why would you lead into something new that's uncomfortable, right? Like you actively want to avoid it. So it's that then another key thing. So you know, it's it's you know accepting that your trauma isn't you, that your past it does not be have to be your future. And the hardest step is leaning in, um, and that's leaning into what the trauma feels like because it's going to pop up, right? Because it's been stored in your body to protect you. Um, but then when you become when you get to a safe place, so sometimes when people leave domestic relationships, right, they're like, why do I feel worse than when I was in the relationship? It's because you're in a safe place now. There's no danger. So your body's now going to want to get rid of that trauma. So it's sort of like leaning into that a little bit and understanding that, you know, it feels scary and it feels awful, but if you when you lean into it, it be, it starts to become less, right? You start to understand that your body is actively trying to do one thing because of the situations you were in, but now you're not there anymore. Like you don't need to feel scared uh, for your safety, even though your body's trying to tell you that, right? Like it's it's just it, it's an automatic mode, and you're we're actively working to get it into more of a of a conscious mode, right? Like from a subconscious, you just do things. Uh, to survive and get through it, right? You know, you don't want you to tiptoe around the house because you don't want your partner to yell at you, right? Or tiptoe around the house because you didn't want to get abused as a kid, right? Um, but you don't have to tiptoe anymore. You're in your own apartment, in your own house. These are some of the small things that might still show up that you can just say to yourself, okay, I recognize that this is how I used to act, but now I want to act this way. And we don't have to be perfect. Like it's not gonna, it's not gonna be overnight. Like it, it is a slow burn. It doesn't have to be super slow. Like you don't have to like take, always take baby steps, right? Like you can take the steps you feel you can take uh, as long as you're taking it forward. And and you might go backwards a little bit, but that's okay. The, the, at least the direction is, is still kind of, kind of forward. It's like if you're, if you're in a snowstorm and you're trying, you're trying to go up a hill, right? And it, it's, you're tight. You don't have the best winter tires. You know, you might not get up there quickly, but as long as you know you're you're spinning the wheels properly, you're turning it properly. Maybe you have four by four, but you're, you're you're still going up the hill. You're not falling backwards, right? So that that's that's the idea. And maybe you slide back because you, you you put the foot off the pedal a little bit, but the idea is that you're still kind of going forward and going on the trajectory that you want to be on. I'm so glad we don't have snow in Florida. That's <laughs> <laughs> all I had to say about that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so what advice do you give the people that come to you and say, fix me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish counseling was was that easy, right? I wish it would be like, <laughs> oh, find an internal switch. I'm going to flip it and you, there you go. Yep, you're fixed, right? Um, like it's it's not about me fixing you or any counselor or therapist or psychiatrist fixing. It's you fixing yourself. And a lot of it is like I, I joke that I joke that counseling. A lot of it is is me try to uh, working with you to get out of your own way, because um, we will always actively get in our own way, right? And well, I shouldn't say that our our traumas and our uh, and our mental health conditions will will get it will get in the way that we want to do, and it frustrates us, right? And and the idea is to sort of untangle that and sort of recognize that yes, these things may have happened to you in the past. You know, we can spend a session talking about it if you want. Like, it's really, really about where the person's at and how we can sort of help you figure out how you can move forward. Because, like, you only see me an hour a week. You see a psychiatrist an hour a week, a psychologist, right? So there's lots of, like, you know, in a 24-hour period, you only see me for an hour. And then, you know, then there's a week in between sessions usually, right? So there's a lot of, it's all, you're by yourself. And this, like, I'm not going to be there physically helping you do that stuff right so it's really about um i mean if someone comes and says to me fix me i'd be like well how, first of all how do we how do we see ourselves because if you, if you see yourself as a broken person well then that's some that's some serious you know self work we've, we've got to sort of examine and unpack right because seeing ourselves as, as broken is is a very uh, debilitating way of looking at things right and, and and our trauma can really make us feel like we are broken and especially like, you know, we see a lot of, you know, stories of people overcoming their traumas, right? And they're really positive and great stories. Um, but someone might see that and go like, well, how do I do that? Like, I, I feel so, so broken, right? And it can, it can bring up feelings, right? And so like, that's where it is a little bit of like, 
that's one person's story. Your story is very different, right? And your path to recovery will look a lot different than than the next person's, right? So, uh, so my advice would be really just to you know to come in with an open open mind of path to recovery, whatever that looks like, and whatever your condition is, will look very will be very unique to you. Uh, and that's actually a really good thing because when we start to compare ourselves to other people, they can it can really uh, complicate and confuse things. Oh yeah, because I mean I've done it. I think I think we're all guilty of doing that at some point. You know, I might look at another podcast and be like, "Oh my god, look at all their followers! Look at all this, this, this!" But my, their show's not my show, and their journey's yeah. not my journey, and. I am a firm believer in what is meant for you will not pass you by. So you just got to keep sticking with it. It's hard. It can be very, but it's so worth it in the end when you get to see you like basically blossom. Yeah. For for me, like, like my, my sort of motto is, you know, help you reach your full potential. And that's going to look different for each person each person's full potential is very different than, than another person um but it's hard work like you if you watch any sports movie right like there's always the training section right where they to become the champ like of course rocky's a very famous one right most of it's you know you know the, tri- the triumphant run up the hill and like but there's lots of those tr- like it's the training right like it's the practice right it's it's the it's the drive to be the best and that you don't have to necessarily you know be an elite athlete but it's what like if if you're feeling like you want to change right like that's actually the best best motivator is that right? because that is coming from you you are saying i want change um when i have someone like that that's 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 golden because um when you hit bumps you just go back to well you walked like you walked in here that means you want better for yourself so how do we keep that in your mind when you're sort of struggling with some of the, the bits to reach your full potential um, and, you know, sort of ignoring some of the other things, right? Um, you know, people commenting, maybe, you know, it's not working or like, or, you know, something upsets you, right? Like it's really about uh, reminding yourself of, of what, of the purpose of what you're doing, right? Which is to, is to, is to better yourself. Every day, every day you need to work on yourself. <laughs> Because every day is not going to be a good day. It's okay to have a bad day. You know, people, I think they get stuck on that. Is if they wake up on a Wednesday and they're like, oh my God, I suck again. You know, it doesn't mean when you wake up on Thursday, you're going to be in the same mind frame. Like, it's okay to have good and bad days. It's called being human and living in this world. (laughs) Absolutely. And life is going to throw you challenges. Life is, it can be incredibly unfair. It could be, you know, you supposed to say it always comes in threes, right? You know, get into a car accident, you break your leg, and then, you know, your cat dies, right? Like, that's just unfair. And it's it's those things of, like, if that's stuff out of your control, like, how to get better is to focus on things you can control, right? And not from, like, an anxiety perspective where you're looking at, how do I control everything? Because like, some people have anxiety, we'll, we'll try and control everything. Um, and it really uh, takes the time away. But like, what what in me can I can I control to sort of keep moving, right? And I think it's really good to to say you're going to have bad days, right? And I think that's it's again, we're all human. Like, like again, like if you got into a car accident, broke your leg, and your cat dies, you have every right to be upset and be a little depressed, right? Because that's shit. Um, but it's the idea of like, okay, I've had my bad day, right? Like that's I've given myself that permission to have that bad day let's move forward right like the you know back to the getting up the hill right so your car has slid back a bit in the snow but you hit the accelerator again you're moving the tires properly and you're slowly making yourself back up to the to the top of the hill or back to the, to the potential that, that you want to reach oh yeah I, you can't give up you just you can't there's no no moving forward if you stand still absolutely and i think a big thing for me is 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 rec- like like the big message I, I like to leave is that like it, the, the change is with you, right? Like it really, no one else is going to change things for you, right? You know, if you go to a counselor, life coach, best friend, you know, supportive parents, right? Like they're all protect what they call protective factors um, or positive things in your life. But what, whatever trajectory you want to take, you're the one that's going to take it, right? So 
it might be hard for someone to to recognize that when they're in it, like when they're in their trauma, they're you know in their addiction, right? Like, and there might be some blame for choice there, right? And you know, if you're older, like maybe you you know, in you know, in, in your adulthood or maybe late teenhood, you might feel you know some response, some responsibility for the choices you are making. But uh, on the flip side, if you can make those choices, you can make other choices that are positive, right? That are good for, for you and, and what you want in your life. And I think that's a big, a big thing, right? Is, is just getting back to the idea that like you just, you want change and change for the better. And it's, it's not a, a straight up process. It is, it is, it can look like a, a, a roller coaster, but more, it is a roller coaster. Cause like, once you get over one thing, like it, another thing can pop up or, you know, life kicks you in the butt with, you know, a, a death in the family or a financial hit. Like that's the other thing around, around this generation of a new generation of trauma that we're seeing is that we are probably in one of the worst global crises for inflation that our generation has seen in quite some time. Um, so there's lots of stressors going on, right? So it can be hard to like, to see the light for for lack of a better term but like what's within your control then right like what can you do in your day to make you feel better right and, I th- and, and a big thing getting over trauma is taking care of yourself and that can look like basic self-care stuff right but like the idea is that in your life you've had someone who's supposed to take care of you not and really let you down and you had to you had to take care of yourself, but in a survival way, not in a nurturing, I like want to feel better way. So that's where self like taking care of ourselves and, you know, he like nurturing ourselves is really important for someone who's trying to get over trauma because you, we all should, we all should have some of those feelings of someone, you know, it's nice when someone brings us a blanket or someone, you know, our coworker gives up, brings us a coffee or, you know, have a friend to cry, to cry on. Right. Um, pets are great for that too. Like they give us that, that nurturing feeling. Um, but it's also really important for us to take care of ourselves and nurture ourselves. Right. So, you know, treating yourself to the, to the salon every now and then, right. Um, having a nice long bath and having your partner take care of the screaming kids in the other room, right? Um, it's all of these things that it, it's around. I'm taking care of myself in a nurturing way, not in a survival way. It's it it'll change it'll change the brain chemistry in your body. Well, what self care looks like because self care to someone who has a trauma history is I need to take care of myself to survive. Whereas we're changing the brain chemistry to say. I'm taking care of myself because I deserve to be taken care of in a, in a nurturing and loving way. Absolutely. I feel like this has been such good advice. (laughs) Do you (laughs) only see clients in Canada or do you do other places? Like if somebody was interested, Uh, they wanted to work with you. What mm -hmm. does that look like? Uh, I think I can. I, I don't necessarily know the rules <laughs> around it. So like each state and, you know, here in Canada too, each province has, um, has rules around it, but um, we, we live in a virtual world. So I would absolutely uh, be open to see if someone's interested to, to look what that, that looks like. Right. Uh, Cause um, we are in this technology age. I mean, I'm in Canada, you're in Florida and we're, we're having this, this conversation. So um, we are in the technological age. So it'd certainly be something uh, we, I'd be willing to explore for sure <laughs> awesome yeah do you have a website anything like uh, you I need to write a stuff. book yeah i feel like oh. <laughs> that, that's on my list <laughs> my long <laughs> list of speaking of, you know of, of full potential that's on my long list of, uh, of things to, to do but i'm mostly on social media so uh, my social media is at jeff o'neill 189 on instagram uh, that's mostly where I am, and I do a lot of just uh, you know inspirational quotes and things like that. Um, I don't have a website as I work; I just work for or for uh, agencies. Um, but uh, maybe down the road, I'll open my own practice and I'll have a website. But um, yeah, no, you always feel free to hit me up on on social media and and chat with me there. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of my my presence at the moment. Perfect. I'll make sure I add them in the show notes. Well your Instagram on there for anyone who wants to reach out for sure. Fantastic. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? I, I yeah, I, I like we're in it as a society right now. Like we really, really are. 
we've just come out of the war, probably like what I feel is our generation's wartime. We saw borders closed. We turned on the TV and saw morgues across the world. We uh, obsessively, at least our family did, looked at the COVID numbers of people who were dying. We had to worry about our family members. And now we're in one of the worst financial crises in our generation uh, that we have seen in, in quite some time. Uh, and we are also, uh, you know, in Canada a little bit too, and of course in the U.S., probably one of the more politically divided we've been in a long time too. We're also one of the more most addictive, addicted societies we've ever been in as well with technology. So we are in it as a society. And if you are feeling like, you know, you've had a traumatic past and you're just not where you want to be, it, it really is around just taking that step, taking that one brave step to figure out what it is you want to be, right? You don't have to be what your fa- has happened to your family, what your trauma history is, what your mental health history is, what you, even if you're actively in addiction right now, it doesn't have to be you. We can always take that one step in, in the direction you want to be. And that's the message I, I really like to leave is that like the change, like I said earlier, the change really is in you. And that can look whatever it is that it looks like for you. It doesn't have to be, you know, what the magazines say, what your friends or family are saying, right? You know, I mean, I talked about parenting earlier. Parenting is one of the most subjective things out there, right? With lots of opinions on it, right? Well, change is the same thing. However you feel is going to be, be best for you. And, you know, and to to take some of the shame away, like maybe right now staying in your addiction is keeping you where you are. You know what? That how that's how it has to be right now. But not being afraid to try something different, to step away from those things that are keeping you in survival mode. Sometimes we gotta stay in survival mode uh, to keep things going. I'm sure there's lots of families right now with the inflation rate. They're in survival mode. Like you know, families are having to pick. You know, gas up their car versus feed their feed their family. That's a very tough decision. But then, the biggest thing is, you know, what what are some things you can do to then to take care of yourself and keep yourself in a in a forward momentum, right? And you know, if you have a a, a bit of a lull, that's why it's a roller coaster. You know, and and things hit the fan and you're not able to to get to the, to that forward momentum. Just the important part is to just put then when you're when you're ready, put that foot back and in front of you and keep, and keep moving forward. Um, cause it's, it's my, <laughs> it might be a rough ride for a little, 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 little while longer. So, and, and how do we sort of navigate those wins? Right. And the other thing too, is like when breaking generate generational trauma, and if it involved, you know, leaving your family or leaving your culture, um, I would highly encourage folks to, especially specifically on the culture side, to really take it from a subjective point of view and look at it and see, what it can do for your life, right? Because um, it might be actually really beneficial for you to look into it, right? And I know there's a lot of, might be a lot of feelings associated to your culture, but finding someone who has not like a knowledge keeper or an elder that can tell you a bit, a bit about the culture uh, from, you know, from an overall perspective and not maybe what uh, society thinks of it um, or what your internal belief has has turned out uh, to think of it because of your experiences, right? Like maybe there's some positive aspects there. Because um, the idea is you want to be good mind, body, and spirit, right? And spiritual one is is very subjective. And I'm hoping from an, like, so I, uh, from an, you can look at your culture from an objective, it's not subjective, objective point of view of like what it actually can, can offer and bring you and your family, right? Because culture can be such a fast, a fantastic thing that can bring, you know, some, you know, some spiritual clarity for yourself, but also, bring, you know, bring a community, bring some part of a community that maybe you haven't accessed for a long time due to your, you know, your history. Don't be afraid. The change is within you, and don't be afraid to to take a step forward uh, and and you know face that trauma. It can it can be really difficult, and it can bring a lot of feelings. Um, but as long as you do it in a safe way, and you know in, in a small to start, and then move forward kind of way, um, it can it can be really life changing. Find some help um, if you're if you're really starting to feel like you're heading in a good direction, or you're trying it by yourself, but you're getting stuck. Like a counselor can just really help you give you some uh, more ideas uh, to get unstuck so you can really start to move in the direction uh, you feel um, you want to move in. Great advice. Great advice. I think that's very useful. Absolutely. If you're stuck or you're even having a hard time getting started, don't be afraid to ask for help. It's okay. It's yeah. okay to not be okay. Yeah, absolutely. 
thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, I've I had a good time. I, I really enjoy I really enjoy podcasting. All right, and that is going to wrap up this episode. Seriously, you guys, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for listening. It means a lot to me. I think we can all agree that we probably have that one friend that really needs to hear this message. So make sure that you share it with them. If you want to get more of me, hey, make sure that you are subscribed to my YouTube channel. You can also find me on Instagram, TikTok. And I want to know, has one of my episodes made an impact on you in any way? Like, for real, I really want to know. So if so, go to my website, truecrimeconnections.com, or you can email me, podcast at truecrimeconnections.com. I want to talk to you guys. Come talk to me. Let's do the damn thing. Keep finding hope and building strength. Until next time.